Welcome to the Center for Teaching and Learning's video series on the Community of Inquiry. In this video, we'll be looking at cognitive presence. Cognitive presence is the extent to which the participants in any particular configuration of a community of inquiry are able to construct meaning through sustained communication. And this is about communicating to students the purpose of the activities in a course. The phrase objectives and outcomes are unfamiliar and confusing to students. On the administrative side, we understand how to provide purpose to course activities. How do we explain them to our students? Do they understand how the items listed on the syllabus connect with individual activities and assessments? Do they understand what they're supposed to get out of an assignment? or do they see it as just something to complete for a grade? This may be one of the most challenging parts of the community of inquiry. What is cognitive presence? It can be described as the result of teacher and social presence. It's the promotion and communication of analysis, construction, and confirmation of meaning and understanding, creating learning environments where students develop their own questions and responses. Cognitive presence can be seen in a course two different ways. First, by communicating the purpose of the course materials, activities, and assessments, we give students a glimpse of the bigger picture. They can understand why they're doing something instead of just what to do. When there is cognitive presence in a course, students are cognitive that an assessment could connect to a bigger project or that you're helping build a real world or professional skill. It's not just what's on the syllabus and what is predetermined in a department meeting. It's the application and awareness of those learning objectives in a course. Secondly, when developing assessments, we want to consider curating or taking a progressive approach to building formative and summative assessments that can help students easily see those connections. When taking a curation or progressive approach to an assessment, think about problem solving to develop activities that center around recognizing a problem's relevance, exploring implications, connecting new ideas to their own experiences, and determining practical applications. The most common practice works with the model of practical inquiry as seen here. So we're looking at a couple different stages. First, the triggering event. This phase initiates the inquiry process through a well thought out activity to ensure full engagement and buy-in from the students. This has several positive outcomes in terms of involving students, assessing the state of knowledge and generating unintended but constructive ideas. So essentially brainstorming, introducing an idea and having them think about it and think about it critically. Exploration. This phase focuses first on understanding the nature of the problem and then searching for relevant information and possible explanation. Next, integration. This phase moves into a more focused and structured phase of constructing meaning. Decisions are made about how we can integrate those ideas and how we can create something with them. Lastly, the resolution. This phase is the resolution of the dilemma or problem whether that is reducing complexity by constructing a meaningful framework or discovering a contextually specific solution. This confirmation or testing phase may be accomplished by direction or vicarious action. So to translate into physical deliverables in a course, the trigger event is the idea that you're bringing, the topic. You're having your students think about it. Next, let's say it's a research project. You would have students explore the literature that's already about the topic or think about their experience that exists with the topic or learn from each other socially. So how can they pull meaning together? Integration, how would they apply it to the final project? So how they're using quotes or statistics or something like that from a research project. And the resolution would be perhaps their thesis or the overall deliverable. Maybe it's a presentation, maybe it's a speech, maybe it's a traditional essay. But in the end, they've come to a conclusion after exploring and integrating what they've learned from this process. Here are a few examples of how you can promote the cognitive process in course design. You can use scaffolding course design, backwards course design, course learning objective overview documents, and formative or summative assessments. Cognitive presence is about being able to communicate the meaning or rationale behind projects, assignments, and lessons. It provides the framework for students to understand the why of coursework. This element is also connected with being able to communicate objectives and outcomes to a student. It's not just for the syllabus anymore. So what have they learned? How they understand it? How has the understanding evolved? And what purpose does this knowledge serve academically, professionally, and personally? By using these frameworks for course design, you're allowing students to easily track the progress of their thinking methodology. They're seeing that learning is, well, it's a process, and it takes you each step of the way till you come to a resolution or a summative assessment. I'd like to take a moment and highlight backward course design. Traditionally, we think of assignments first, then which learning objectives does that assignment connect to, to meet department standards or institution standards. When working with the practice of backward course design, we look at the learning objective and build formative and summative assessments out of that objective. 
working backwards. For example, if your students need a project that involves oral communication with an authentic career skill, you would probably create a presentation. But do we just give them instructions on how to create a presentation and have them submit it? No. We want to think about what the student will need to find out independently to build that project and create smaller assessments or activities that will guide them on this journey. They need to be aware of what they need to know, what they need to find out, how they can put it together. These lower stake activities are considered formative assessments because they build the skills needed for the summative assessment, which is the summary of the skills learned. You can have a formative brainstorming or research activity, and then the student will use their collected work and their independent research uh, or collaborative activity to build the final assessment. Consider using more informal e-learning tools like discussion boards, blogs, or journals as practice environments for formative assessments. Have them do brainstorming, interviews, or peer review using these tools so the interaction can reinforce and build students' skill and knowledge to have a more successful summative assessment like a research project or a presentation. Thank you for viewing this presentation. Please proceed to the learning materials in this module. Afterwards, complete the professional development task. For your reference, here are the sources used in this presentation.